Jack, vamos a comenzar. We are going, mm -hmm. a, we are going to get started. Bueno, eh, sean, sean todos... Que todos tenemos conocimientos diferentes. Sean todos muy, muy bienvenidos al seminario departamental del, del CICATA Querétaro, del Instituto Politécnico Nacional. Eh, el, el día de hoy eh, tenemos una plática muy, muy especial. Eh, desde hace ya muchos años he estado yo en lo personal como tratando de, de transitar hacia hacia proyectos que, que tienen que ver con sustentabilidad. Eh, y el día de hoy eh, tenemos ese, esa, esa orientación en la plática. La plática va a ser en español, pero, va a ser en inglés, perdón, pero siéntanse en la libertad como costumbre eh, de poner sus preguntas en el chat en, en español, si ustedes gustan, o en inglés también, eh, como ustedes prefieran. Eh, el día de hoy tenemos a, a Jack Ray que, que nos, eh, nos contacta desde, desde el área de Boston. Eh, Jack Ray eh, pertenece al Space Enabled Group, un grupo que tiene la profesora Daniel Wood en, en el Media Lab del MIT. Eh, Jack se dedica a utilizar imágenes de observación de la Tierra y a modelar sistemas complejos para el desarrollo sostenible en todo el mundo. Aquí en el Space Enabled se está desarrollando un, un sistema que va a ser muy interesante y del cual Jack nos va a hablar. Este, este sistema tiene que ver con el apoyo a la toma de decisiones y en particular en estos momentos eh, de decisiones que tienen que ver con el coronavirus. Y este sistema se ha estado implementando en diferentes ciudades eh, del mundo, que eh, incluyen los países de, de Brasil, Chile, Angola, Indonesia y ahora también en, aquí en México, en Creta. Entonces, eh, Jack, it's, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us. Eh, eh, please be welcome to, to the National Institute uh, Polytechnic. And uh, I handle out the microphone to you. Please go ahead. Gracias. Uh, here we go. So, hola. No hablo muy bien español, así que hablaré en inglés. Uh, pido disculpas si traduje mal algo en la presentación. Uh, so, howdy everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Salas. You know, talking about the space and today, as well as our general methodology. Um, to start with, our, our group's uh, mission is to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Uh, by justice here, we really mean uh, social and environmental sustainability and equity both on Earth and in space. Uh, so in general, like how we go about our work, uh, so we, we tend to focus on using sort of six different things in the and by these we mean uh, satellite Earth observation, uh, satellite positioning and navigation, uh, Jack, uh, satellite communication. Jack. Oh, yes? Sorry to interrupt you. I think that your sound sometimes no is problem. broken. You may want to turn off your video, oh. and probably that, that will improve your, your bandwidth. Yeah. Oh, yes, that, you're probably right. Uh, so let me, uh, sorry, let me fix this real fast. Uh, stop my video. Also, let me, oh, also let me switch to a better Wi-Fi network real fast. Uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now let me. Okay, here we are. Uh, can you hear me? I think that now, now, it's, now it's better. Excellent, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just, I'll start, you know, back over just a little bit. So, uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, so our group's mission is to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Uh, by justice, we primarily mean social and environmental sustainability and equity, both on Earth and in space. Uh, and then when we say designs enabled by space, we primarily are referring to these six technologies, uh, satellite earth observation, uh, satellite positioning and navigation, satellite communication, uh, human space flight and microgravity research, uh, technology transfer, and fundamental research infrastructure, uh, including, you know, 
when we say research infrastructure, we include that of the, you know, things like universities and researchers and researchers groups, including here at the, the Instituto Politecnico Nacional. Uh, as you can tell, not all of these are literally in space. Some of these, you know, are sort of the, the side effects of pursuing space related research. Uh, in terms of who, who we are, uh, you know, we're a mix of, uh, you know, undergraduate students, graduate students, uh, and uh, professional researchers, and of course, uh, you know, professors. And we tend to come from these sort of six backgrounds, uh, you know, design, art, social science, complex systems modeling, uh, satellite engineering, and a few different computer science uh, fields, including geospatial analysis and artificial intelligence. Many of us uh, actually have some amount of background in multiple of these, and we are lo really looking to, to bring these to, together in our work. Our projects uh, tend to align into sort of three different uh, themes. Uh, some of our projects hit multiple of these themes, some hit just one, uh, these being uh, you know, designing systems to make space uh, both accessible and sustainable. You know, historically, uh, you know, particularly starting out, uh, you know, access to space was really only available to uh, a couple of countries, you know, wealthy and wealthy countries with large militaries. And that's starting to change and we want to, to help facilitate that change uh, and make it both available to more countries, but also just to more people, including, you know, universities and communities. Uh, and part of it being uh, accessible and sustainable means also limiting the amount of space debris and making sure that uh, space traffic management is uh, feasible. So our second one there is uh, designing space technology to support sustainable development. Uh, so here, this is really about using uh, space technology to benefit us here on Earth and improve our own sustainability here. Finally, the third one is exploring the links between technology and justice or equity. Uh, and this is, you know, not necessarily directly space related, but we think it's sort of a general uh, uh, sort of like moral cause uh, of ours as researchers in this field. Uh, so for the, the rest of the presentation, I'll be going into, you know, some of the examples of projects that we work on. Uh, many of these, there's more information available on our website, uh, and I'm also happy to go into more detail on any of them during uh, sort of the question and answer portion of this talk as well. Uh, and people can always reach me by email afterwards. So the first project, we'll start with, you know, something more uh, on the sort of straight up aerospace engineering side of things, uh, which is we're investigating the use of, of uh, wax as a rocket fuel, uh, both candle wax and beeswax, actually, I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, and, and, and in particular, in this, what I'll be talking about here in more detail is sort of the use of using centrifugal casting uh, to make that wax propellant, centrifugal casting both on the surface of Earth and also casting it uh, in microgravity environments as well. So why the interest in uh, wax? Well, you know, so wax uh, is much cheaper than most rocket fuels and it's much safer, uh, both for people in terms of handling uh, and in terms of, you know, environmental impact. Uh, this means that if you can use uh, wax rocket fuel it makes uh, you know designing particularly smaller satellites much more feasible. Um, and so with that, so here, for instance, we have a diagram of one of our test setups, uh, testing burning it. You can see the diagram now. I'll show a brief video of it uh, actually burning. Uh, so there you can see, uh, and this is just, this is, that right there is just plain candle wax that we are using, uh, essentially. Uh, you can add some additives to it to increase the performance, but that's mostly all that it is. Uh, and in general, we're not intending this for use uh, as a launch vehicle to get things into space, but we in instead intend this to be mostly used uh, for orbit maintenance and, uh, and orbital changes once you're in space. Uh, and as you can see, you know, the device and everything for it is actually quite small there. Um, so yeah, uh, here you can actually see one of our graduate students, uh, Juliet Wanieri on the, the right, uh, testing the centrifugal casting process on a microgravity flight. Uh, so these those flights that go up and go into, you know, they do uh, sort of ballistic, uh, you know, rises and falls to simulate microgravity for short periods of time. And this is, we're testing like, how feasible is it to cast the wax into the necessary, uh, like hollow 
uh, tube annulus shape to be used as fuel. Um, here, this is not in microgravity. This is back in our lab. Uh, you can see this is actually molten wax. Uh, I know it looks like water, but this is in fact just clear wax. Uh, and as it's spinning, it starts with air bubbles in the center, but as we continues, it solidifies into, uh, or it stabilizes into a nice uh, even annulus, which you can just see it just did there. Um, and so then we let it cool while continuing to spin it and keeping it in this shape. And once it cools, you know, it hardens and it locks into that shape. And then we can, it's in a, a in the right form to be used as a propellant. So as I said earlier, we're not just looking at candle wax or, or paraffin wax, uh, we're also uh, looking at beeswax. And the reason for that is as cheap uh, and safe as paraffin wax is, it is typically produced from fossil fuels. And, you know, if possible, we would like to avoid that. Uh, and so, you know, beeswax is a way that does not involve fossil fuels. And in fact, uh, is currently mostly a waste product uh, from uh, honey production. Uh, so paraffin wax has actually been studied as a propellant, uh, including by one of our researchers back during when he was doing his PhD at another university. Uh, but beeswax has not really been studied, and so we've been comparing them, both their performance uh, when burning, but also uh, how easily is it is to uh, cast the, the beeswax as well. So you can see some of the graphs from some of those experiments here. Yeah, in terms of like getting the beeswax, we literally there's a there's a an apiary, uh, you know, a bee sort of honey sort of production and research group in the Boston area, and here is one of our undergraduates, uh, Alana Sanchez, actually collecting some of the beeswax for us to use in our experiments. Uh, so moving on to another project that we work in is we're actually doing this in collaboration with a number of uh, other institutions, including the World Economic Forum and the European Space Agency and the University of Texas at Austin, uh, to develop a, a space sustainability rating to incentivize satellite operators to pursue long-term sustainability uh, in the space environment. So what exactly do we mean by this? Uh, so this project is, is led by one of our researchers, Dr. Manu Rathnasabapathy, um, who you can see in the bottom left there. Uh, so the idea is to have a, sort of a satellite equivalent uh, to a system like LEED for buildings. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with buildings, uh, with, with LEED, uh, but uh, it's a, a rating system that's used to rate new buildings in terms of like how environmentally sustainable they are in terms of energy efficiency and their building materials and that kind of thing. This is very similar but for satellites with, you know, these like silver, gold, platinum rankings. And the idea is to focus on ensuring that things like orbit selection, orbit maintenance, and satellite end of life planning are all in place so as to avoid collisions and the generation of space debris. In general, the, the, so the idea is that satellite operators would voluntarily opt into having their satellites rank. Uh, and you can see some of the different like metrics that we'd be looking at here in, in terms of how that rating would be generated. And then once they rate, rent, got their satellites ranked, you know, they could then display that to others to sort of demonstrate their commitment to sustainability. Uh, so that's the, the idea there. The third project uh, we have, this is uh, more on the sustainability on Earth side of things, uh, is the development of observation systems to support monitoring of forests and, uh, and invasive plants in Benin and Ghana in West Africa. So this project is led by one of our graduate students, uh, Ufoma Obenmada, uh, who you'll see here left. So here, this is a video, this here on the, the, in the foreground, the plant is called water hyacinth. It's an invasive plant species in Western Africa. It's actually native to uh, Brazil. Uh, and as you can see, it very much interferes with uh, transportation, with fishing, provides a, a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Uh, and as you, so as you might imagine, uh, you know, several organizations, including the local government, are trying to prevent its spread. Uh, some local companies have actually figured out how to harvest it, dry it, and grind it up to use it to help clean up uh, chemical and oil spills. So there they found like a useful use, use for it, and that's also helping to, to combat it. And so we're working with them to, to help uh, support that. Uh, and we do that in a few different ways. One is we've been using uh, earth observation data, uh, particularly from Landsat and Sentinel. Uh, to help track uh, the spread of water hyacinth here in this particular lake called Lake Nokwe. Uh, and then, so we use, you know, so things like NDVI to help identify where's vegetation on the lake. 
and then do, using various change detection uh, filters to sort of see how is it growing and spreading over time to feed into prediction for where will it be in the coming months uh, so that uh, you know, various uh, you know, organizations can take action. In addition to the satellite observation data, uh, UFOMA, she's also using uh, drones uh, and has been putting together some cheap uh, in situ sensors that go in the, that stay in the, the water and the lake to help monitor conditions and, and help also validate the satellite data. Uh, a key part of this is understanding not just the water hyacinth, but also the akaja. Uh, and the akaja are these temporary fishing structures that are built into the lake. You can see on the, the right there. Uh, many places uh, around the world have similar structures. Uh, and yeah, so that's what those are. Uh, so the idea here is we're going to be working with a company, we're working with a US-based company called Blue Raster to develop uh, a free online platform that presents some of this data that we're putting together from these different sources. And then this platform would be able to be used by the local government, by those companies harvesting the water hyacinth, uh, university researchers in Benin, uh, and even individual uh, fishermen uh, who are out there trying to, to figure out, you know, what, what is, you know, navigating the lake going to look like in the coming weeks and months. Uh, something I should probably, maybe should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, this project and many of our projects uh, are structured around uh, various of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this project is particularly focused on Sustainable Development Goal number 15 uh, and is partially funded by NASA for this effort. Another project, uh, who another one of the graduate students, uh, Prathima Munayapa, uh, you can see there in the bottom left, so she's uh, doing a few different things. Uh, one, she's working with the, the Kasi community in India uh, to learn about how they use the, the roots of a tree called the ficus tree uh, to create you know, these really impressive, actually, architectural features like bridges. Uh, and you know, her investigation here is part of this broader effort of developing uh, sort of a geospatial service, uh, both on online and on phones, uh, that she calls Scribe to help allow indigenous groups around the world to document and share their, their cultural knowledge. Uh, here's a brief video that sort of walks through uh, that. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, there's people sign up, uh, there's terms and conditions, there's also uh, an ethics agreement. Is this playing? I don't know if it is. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. There's a, an ethics and guidelines because a documentation involving indigenous communities can be a very sensitive matter. Uh, they, you know, there's also very sort of training uh, that's part of this platform, associated documents to make sure that users are complying with UNESCO convention. Uh, then when you wait just a moment, uh, so they're going to go to adding uh, new posts. Uh, so when they add new posts, they need to identify local collaborators in the indigenous community to ensure that the, that community is involved and consents. Uh, the users can then post images, uh, audio, uh, video, and even 360 degree video. Uh, uh, so then I'll wait for it to catch up for a moment. Uh, but uh, then, you know, once people have started to put together, you know, individual posts, like you can see here, some, some video. Uh, the idea is then that these, these would be compiled into sort of larger projects. Uh, that these would be compiled into larger projects that would have descriptions uh, and that would have community moderators uh, who can approve posts. And that these projects and the post would be uh, geolocated for future reference. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the general idea behind uh, scribe. Uh, the next project, so this project here that I'm going to talk about next is actually my own, uh, the, one of the ones that I work on directly along with a few other graduate students. Uh, it's called the VITA Decision Support System. Uh, so for a couple of years now, uh, actually back when I started in Space Enabled, uh, I started working on a project. The idea was to build sort of a modeling framework it, that would support uh, sustainable development decision making and inform Earth observation uh, system design. Uh, 
So this framework, when we originally conceived it, it had four components, uh, environment, uh, societal impact, uh, human decision-making, and technology design. And the idea was that many sustainable development uh, contexts can be thought of as complex systems where in the environment and the humans, they're not neatly separated uh, and considered separately and they need to be considered together. And then by approaching you know, a situation from this perspective, we would you know, help support policy making uh, and the design of future Earth observation satellites. Uh, you know, we would been in the process of applying this framework uh, to a few different applications. Uh, you know, one of them had to do with mangrove forests uh, in the Rio de Janeiro area. Uh, but then, of course, the coronavirus pandemic happened. I was actually in Rio de Janeiro uh, when, uh, in early March when it started spreading, and so that was, that was interesting. Uh, many of our local points of contact, you might imagine, uh, you know, started to have a change in priorities. Uh, to, and so we sort of shifted focus and started working with uh, a variety of different locations uh, to apply the same sort of framework, but add in public health and sort of tailor it more specifically at coronavirus related decision making and impact analysis. Uh, and that's resulted in sort of this uh, framework, this diagram that you can see here. Uh, I'll show part, part of this means that we have a prototype, uh, you know, sort of simulation platform and user interface. Uh, the, so this, in, this sort of screenshot here is from our prototype, it focuses on Rio de Janeiro. Uh, but we have similar versions for the, uh, the Región Metropolitana uh, de Chile, uh, uh, one that covers uh, part of Indonesia. Uh, and actually our most recent one is, uh, we're working with uh, Dr. Salas and, and others on one that is for uh, El Estado de Carretero uh, de Mexico. Uh, so in here, you can see both uh, time series data presented on the left uh, and geospatial data uh, presented on the right, uh, both uh, in terms of at the, they, this they is showing data both at the level of individual uh, uh, barrios uh, and then also some, you know, just uh, earth observation data as well. Uh, the idea is here we present, you know, data that includes public health, uh, the environment, uh, and economic changes. So we can see how all of these are changing as the city and the states uh, respond to coronavirus. Uh, so, you know, you can see some of those categories of information here. You can also see in the temporal data that there is both uh, uh, historic, uh, there's both historic uh, data, you know, that has already happened and then sort of simulated data. And so we've been building that out uh, as we've gone along uh, to sort of improve that simulation and we're partnering with some people at uh, Harvard Medical School for exactly this purpose. Uh, and actually, as Dr. Silas well as know, uh, this morning we had our first meeting that was uh, all of the different countries that I listed who are involved in this. We all sort of had a joint meeting and, and shared information uh, that went really well. Uh, so that was, uh, it was excellent to, to see. Uh, then uh, this final project that I'll, that I'll talk about here is uh, sort of more focused on our work on technology design and anti-racism uh, led by Dr. Caitlin Turner. Uh, Dr. Turner, her background is actually, she's a, a nuclear engineer by background and you know, did work in uh, nuclear uh, non-proliferation and that kind of thing in the past uh, and is now working with us to, to focus on you know, how technology can you know, uh, help improve, uh, you know, equity and decrease racism and that kind of thing. Uh, so to this end, uh, this project seeks to highlight a, a framework to encourage the use of anti-racism in technology design. Uh, in particular, we sort of examine the inputs and outputs of designing both small-scale technologies all the way up to large systems like airports. Uh, and ask how these systems are either increasing or decreasing equity for traditionally marginalized uh, racial groups. Uh, here you can see a diagram of some of the approach that we take to that. Uh, oh, sorry if you can hear uh, uh, El Perro uh, está gritando. Uh, the, hopefully it's not too distracting. Uh, but uh, here we can see uh, you know, looking at a variety of systems, uh, you know, we look at it from a different sort of standpoint, you know, engineering, policy, uh, architecture, we consider them throughout their life cycle, not just during initial design. 
Uh, and in this, you know, we're taking sort of a systems architecture approach and considering all of the stakeholders, uh, not just the, the technical system itself. Uh, yeah, hopefully this is, this slide is legible. Uh, I was definitely sort of stretching my ability to uh, translate things into to Spanish with this one. Uh, so if there ends up being any questions on this, I'm happy to, to go into more detail. Uh, yeah, I think that's, those are the, the sort of the general overview. I wanted to sort of give like a brief touch on all of these projects. Uh, and I, and then leave most of our time for sort of questions and answers and the opportunity to go into more detail on, on any of them. Uh, you know, so I'll also, I can always back up and show slides again as well, of course. Uh, but I also wanted to show people, you know, there's my email uh, and there's our website. Uh, you know, we're, we're very, uh, accessible and, and reachable. So. Thank, thank you, Ray. Jack. Thank you, Jack. Uh, now we have one, que one question from Jose Prado. He's asking how high uh, one of these wax rockets has been able to reach. So, uh, yeah, uh, on Earth, I don't know uh, the, the max height that the, the wax rockets have been able to reach. Uh, I can back us up there. Uh, the, I know in general, we are, uh, we are not intending them for use uh, as a launch vehicle to get from the surface of Earth into space. We intended it for use on satellites for changing their orbit. I will say it is fairly high because, uh, uh, so I don't know if people are aware, but NASA is currently planning a mission for later this decade to return uh, samples from the surface of Mars uh, back to Earth. Uh, and they're still, you know, designing that mission and everything right now, but they are actually considering using paraffin wax as the, the launch fuel to launch back off of Mars. Uh, so paraffin is probably insufficient to launch off of Earth, but it, it is sufficient to launch off of Mars. Uh, and because it's a nice stable solid that isn't too sen sensitive to temperatures, and doesn't degrade over time, uh, it makes sense for that kind of, you know, a long duration, sending it all the way to Mars, sitting on the surface of Mars for a while, and then being ready to, to launch back off. I see, I see. Yeah, but it currently is not uh, in use or, or is it, it's not planning to be used in the short term. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think anybody is, I don't think anybody has actually used it on a satellite nor will they in the next couple of years. I think most people are looking at this more on the, like the five to eight year time scale for when to use uh, paraffin wax. Okay, okay. So we have a, 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 another question from Alejandro Gomez. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, what are your units of analysis? Uh, uh, let's see, two, two questions first. So, because yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, so it depends. Uh, so if you mean, for instance, on, if I flip over here to the end, uh, uh, with the, the Vita, uh, it depends on the location um, in terms of their, the geographic unit of analysis. Uh, here in Rio de Janeiro, uh, it's been focusing uh, at the municipal level. So that temporal data there is at the, the municipal level. Uh, and some of our other data is also available at the, the barrio level, uh, the neighborhood uh, level. Uh, the, for some of the other situations, uh, including uh, in, in Chile, for instance, we're looking at uh, the level of, you know, a, a region, a, a state, uh, and there, you know, our smallest units of analysis are individual cities or municipalities. So that's the general range that we're looking at is somewhere between a city and a state. Uh, so that's for that project. Uh, for the, the project uh, involving water hyacinth in Benin, uh, there we're looking at uh, uh, like this Lake Noque. Uh, this lake is, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a, it's a fairly large lake. If I remember correctly, it's around 30 or 40, I'm trying to remember. I, th I think it's 20 kilometers across uh, east-west and about 10 kilometers uh, north-south. Uh, so it's quite large. Uh, 
uh, and min there's several quite large uh, cities around it, particularly on the, the southern side. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, that's about the, the size of the area that you're looking at there. Uh, and then into the other question about the software, mm -hmm. uh, most of the software that we use is uh, not proprietary. Uh, it's uh, freely available. Uh, the, the Vita code that I was showing, uh, that's actually available on, on GitHub. Uh, I can put a link to that uh, in, the, in the chat, actually, if people are interested in looking at that. We also commonly use uh, Google Earth Engine for processing uh, Earth satellite data. Uh, some of our web platforms, like the one that I'm showing right now, this one right here, uh, that one is more proprietary since it's made by a private company called uh, Blue Raster. But uh, no, pretty much all of our data and as much as possible, all of our software is, is not proprietary, it's freely available. Uh, so uh, yeah. And in fact, with Vita, you know, most of the project, most of our data that we've been using is publicly available data that our partners have been sharing with us. Uh, so. There is a question from Eduardo Morales. Can you breathe in microgravity? Uh, so uh, breathing, uh, I mean, if you are, if you're in uh, like uh, an air environment, uh, yes, you can, can breathe. So uh, the, let me flip back uh, to, uh, here we go. So here, you know, so microgravity basically means that you're just not feeling the, the force of gravity. Uh, this happens just whenever you're falling, which is here. So this is literally just in an airplane that goes up and goes down. Uh, they can breathe fine, obviously. Uh, the International Space Station would be another example of being in a microgravity environment. Uh, we say microgravity because in all of these cases, uh, the gravity is, is not entirely absent. Even on the International Space Station, if you let go of pin, it will tend to slowly drift uh, you know, in one direction or another. And then I see another question uh, from Jose Armando. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, with, uh, yeah, with Vita, the, so the public health, uh, we use uh, what's called, oh, it's not right. Let me skip past this. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, we use uh, what's called uh, an SEIR model. Uh, let me flip to over here to this diagram here. Uh, so for public health, we are using uh, uh, what's called a, uh, an SEIR model. I'll actually put a link. Sus suspected, recovered, and infected? Yes, uh, which is, that's exactly what it stands for. Uh, and it basically d divides up the population into uh, some categories. Uh, actually, here, I'll show a diagram of it here. Uh, so our public health uh, up. Uh, so yeah, so you can see this is a, a simplified diagram of our public health model here. So you can see it divides the population into these categories, and then you have various factors which control uh, how people move from one to another. Uh, the exact categories depend on what data is available in the, you know, in this location. Um, and so environment, so the, the environment, on the environmental side of things, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been doing is looking at, uh, you know, existing like air quality data and water quality data and seeing how that's being impacted uh, and seeing how, uh, you know, what correlations exist between uh, the closure policies and people's mobility, that kind of thing. Uh, in terms of the distancing policies that you're talking, that you mentioned here, uh, uh, where we've been using whatever policies are in place in the specific location. Uh, so let me actually pull up, uh, I'll pull up our, here we go, I'm pulling up the, the model itself and we can just sort of show that. Uh, my computer is running a bit slow. Uh, I may kill the presentation. Uh, so, here we go. It's still pulling up. But uh, 
is this going to show up? Uh, yeah, so here's once again Rio de Janeiro. Uh, these are, uh, Rio de Janeiro had like a six phase like reopening program. And so those are the policies that we use uh, there. Uh, but it varies from place to place. Uh, uh, Chile, for instance, had, uh, oh, sorry, switch to screens here. Uh, uh, Chile, for instance, has a, a five step uh, program instead. And so, yeah, it just depends on what's available and each location and what we're going to use. Uh, yeah. I, I see. So I, I have one question for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, it looks to me that you're working in, in projects that are very broad, mm -hmm. uh, that, that affect uh, communities all around the world. But uh, I don't see that there are like a lot of people uh, like uh, working on these projects. So for instance, you work with people in, in several countries at mm -hmm. the same time. How do you manage to, to, to do this? Uh, or is there is a hidden team that I have not been able to, to observe? Or? Uh, so, yeah, so I mean, this, this has been, I would say, an issue. Uh, the, we do have, it, it is not just like me, for instance, uh, but for, for Vita, for instance, uh, there's uh, another graduate student, uh, uh, Seamus Lombardo, uh, who has been the one who's primarily been working on, say, the, the Indonesia uh, context. Uh, and uh, he was also the one who organized the, the meeting this morning. Yes. Uh, the, we have another graduate student who has been more recently has been working with us on trying to use earth observation imagery to track uh, changes since the, the onset of coronavirus. We've been bringing on some undergraduates, uh, partnering with people at other universities. So we do have uh, in total, like the US part of the VITA team uh, right now is probably about 10 or 12 people mm -hmm. in total. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not zero people. Uh, or it's not just me. I, I certainly wouldn't be able to handle all of this. And then it also certainly helps that we do have, you know, such strong collaborations in all of these areas, uh, including yourself uh, and the and the others from the, the Ministry of Science. Uh, so, yeah, that that certainly helps because that sort of guides us and lets us know what information is available. You know, what are the relevant questions, uh, that kind of thing. That, that's very inspirational because uh, it's not that many people that are doing things that affect uh, a lot or, or have the potential to affect a lot of people in the world. Yes, we, we wish there was more. Uh, there's certainly plenty of good work that could be done if we had more people. So, so we have Itzel Alejandra who wants to ask something. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, I'm um, sorry if my question is too basic, basic but this, is my, this isn't, isn't my field. So, and well, I also had some troubles with my internet connection and I got lost a bit. I understood you use the drones in order to monitor the plants on the lake. Mm -hmm. um, is it a simple type of, of plant or are there many? If so, how is it that you are able to distinguish in case you have different species? I thought it's, it's like very interesting because right now we are having a subject in which we are uh, seeing this kind of problematics in questions of uh, pollutions on, on lakes. Okay, yeah, so it helps that it, uh, so if I flip over here, so it helps that the primary thing that grows on this lake uh, is water hyacinth. Uh, so this lake, somewhat confusing, you can see, uh, down on the southern end, there's this channel. This is actually, this is uh, an artificial channel. It's a man-made channel that connects to the ocean uh, here. So this lake is uh, connect, directly connected to the ocean. Uh, it's heavily uh, salinated. Uh, it's basically like ocean water, uh, but the exact levels of salt uh, vary over the course of the year. Uh, but the main thing that can grow on it uh, is water hyacinth, which certainly helps identify uh, and distinguish it. Uh, it makes it harder in some of the rivers, which you can sort of see on the northern end, uh, because sometimes those have other things that grow in them, uh, you know, things like mangrove trees and that kind of thing uh, that can make it harder to identify. Uh, 
But other than that, uh, their, their NDVI, some of their uh, spectral qualities, uh, particularly when you look at the infrared, they do look a bit different than uh, like mangrove trees, for instance, which are the other, the only real other kind of vegetation. Uh, and then the other thing is mangrove trees don't change very quickly. Uh, this water hyacinth does. Uh, it goes through cycles of pretty much all of the water hyacinth in the lake will die off every, every year and then regrow six months later. Uh, so that kind of like rapid change uh, is another thing that we look for because, you know, mangroves tend to, to stay put uh, and tend to, you know, grow or die on the order of many years rather than on the order of weeks or months. But agree that, uh, um, go ahead. Can, uh, have you already looked for another um, option to do something with the, with the plants on the lake? Uh, yeah, so I can actually pull up, uh, in terms of like using them for something, uh, let me pull up, uh, so one of our partners over there is an organization called uh, Greenkeeper Africa, let's pull up their website real fast, uh, and so they, uh, uh, most of their website is in French, uh, so yeah, so see these, uh, so these are uh, Zorbents, they, so these are, they sell these to, to clean up chemical and oil spills. Uh, and they are made out of harvested, uh, I think they have a, I'm trying to see if they have any images of this, but they actually harvest that water hyacinth, yeah. Uh, and and they dry it and grind it up, and that's what they pack into those like cushions, those pillows, uh, to use uh, to absorb oil. And so, yeah, so that's one way that they've been trying to sort of cut back on the amount of this water hyacinth that's in the lake. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I will say the issue of species identification can certainly be an issue. Uh, one of the projects I was working on in Rio de Janeiro before coronavirus had to do with their mangroves there. And we certainly had the issue of uh, they had, you know, three different species of mangrove trees that all sort of had different uh, uh, surface reflectance qualities. Uh, and it made it, it definitely complicated being able to tell what were mangrove trees, you know, were they doing better, were they less healthy, were they damaged, uh, versus whether, you know, one species of mangrove tree was replacing another. Uh, definitely agree that that can be an issue. Yeah, because I, I mean, if it is difficult in like in real life to try to to distinguish between the species, I cannot imagine how it can be done with the drones. Yeah. Um, it's kind of difficult for me. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree. I can't identify them uh, like on my own by sight. Uh, in that case, you know, we worked with uh, a local university uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro who specializes in this kind of thing. And so they were used to a lot of mapping of, of the mangroves and they were actually doing some research on trying to very precisely measure the, the reflectance of the leaves of these different species to, to help with the, the, the identification by drones and by satellites. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Jack, I have a I have a question for you. Like, mm -hmm. This is like a, a kind of personal question. Yeah. Once I, I read that uh, in the media lab, uh, uh, if, if you if you know that you like uh, computer science, or you know that you like uh, mechanical engineer or chemistry, uh, then you don't belong there. So they they like people that don't fit anywhere else. Uh, so. Uh, it, how how is it uh, been uh, at the at the media lab? Uh, what are the personal characteristics that made you a good candidate for the media lab? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely a bit different. I will say there are some people there who are you know sort of straight up, uh, you know, computer scientists or engineers. A lot of it comes down to like what projects you're interested in. Uh, 
I, many of the projects that I've presented here uh, would not cleanly fit into one department at a university in most cases. Uh, they, you know, involve, you know, different departments. Uh, and, and even if you are looking at, you know, just say, you know, an aerospace or an earth mm -hmm. science department, you know, some of the stuff that we do is more on the applied side than what is commonly funded in the US where they're looking for more, you know, basic fundamental research. So I think that's part of, you know, what kind of projects are you interested in? A lot of this comes back to, uh, I'd say a lot of our individuals are not necessarily, you know, spread out. Some of our individuals are very narrow, like satellite engineers kind of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of it's the, the, us working as a team on these things, uh, I would say is one of the real distinguishing factors. Uh, and the other groups in the Media Lab, uh, they work on very different things than us. Uh, but I think that's what's in common is that, you know, they tend to have their research group tends to be made up of people with very different backgrounds. Uh, that are working together on some project. Uh, yeah. That's, that's interesting to hear because uh, the, your audience now comes from very different disciplines, academic disciplines. Uh, we have people that, is inter that are interested in bi biotechnology, um, mechatronics, uh, alternative energies, material science, computer vision, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, right. So we have a, a question from Jose Prado. Wanna, wanna read? Yeah, about, uh, yes, about practice. Yes, they, I would say they come up all the time in Earth observation. Uh, actually, I don't think I used to actually had as like the background on my, on my computer desktop was uh, an image that I had put together of the, the Grand Canyon in the US. You commonly will see uh, the, the rivers uh, we'll, we'll see rivers tend to form fractal patterns, uh, for instance. Uh, the, I'm trying to think, uh, we'll sometimes model the, the water hyacinth in that kind of way, as sort of an agent-based system, uh, uh, almost like a, uh, what we, you could call cellular automata kind of thing for, for how the water hyacinth grows over time. Uh, yeah, I would say I, I typically tend to see it with rivers, uh, yeah, with rivers being the, the main thing, uh, you know, particularly, you see it mostly, it must be in canyons, but. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so uh, I have one more question. And uh, Jack, uh, was it more difficult to get into MIT or to, you know, <laughs> keep, keep up the, the pace and? Uh, it's probably more difficult for, I don't know, the, the, the undergraduates at MIT seem very busy to me. Like, mm -hmm. it seems like they, they, they really like have a rough time of it. Uh, so for them, it might be different. For the graduate students, I think most of us, you know, we tend to find work that we really enjoy. And so mm -hmm. I think that the, the harder part is the, the getting in. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's definitely not, you know, impossible at, at all, to say the least. You know, we have people from, uh, from all over in our research group, uh, including, uh, oh, actually, uh, 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 yeah, Regina from, uh, uh, we have one of our newest graduate students who, uh, uh, let me pull, I'm trying to remember the name of her undergraduate. She specifically mentioned that uh, IPN was uh, her undergraduate's uh, rival. Oh, oh. Uh, so uh, I, I can't remember what, univer what university she went to though. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, from, it's from, from Mexico. Uh, yeah, we have people from, from all over. We've had people from, from Kenya, uh, Nigeria, uh, India, uh, and uh, we've actually, uh, Lisbeth Torrios, we, we, we had a couple from Mexico. Uh, and then obviously uh, a few from, from the US and everything. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so I think that, uh, well, I think that there are no more questions. I, I don't have oh. them myself. Uh, so, uh, so Jack, uh, I, I will like to express my deepest gratitude uh, for your, your participation in this seminar. Th 
thank you very much for all the mm -hmm. interesting topics that you addressed and and look forward to see you very soon yeah thank you so much uh, i'm sorry that my spanish was not good enough to uh uh to uh to give this talk in spanish uh but thank you so I think much. it was great it was great thank you y, y, y gracias a, a, a todos ustedes por su, por su asistencia a este seminario. Eh, les agradezco mucho y pues como siempre los vemos aquí la, la próxima semana. Muchísimas gracias a todos.